Go with me, if you will, to uh, in your little booklet to page number six. Page six. This we're gonna we're gonna make this application to marriage, but it's so true everywhere, and it's true of every relationship. We're not perfect at relationships. We're we're not perfect at life. I don't know about you, but I need forgiveness. I think you do too. I would think if anyone would say, I don't need forgiveness, it's the simple truth that you just don't know that you do. <laughs> you know, you just don't know that you do. Uh, I'm going to skip just a little bit, so I'm going to jump around just a little bit. First, notice with me uh, about three little sections down that uh, quote by Lewis Meads. Uh, I love this about forgiveness. He, he writes that uh, in one of his books, and, and it's just a, a great statement. He says this, and it's so true. He says, we talk a good forgiving line as long as someone else needs to do it. I could stop right there, and that's a good quote right there. We talk a good forgiving line as long as someone else needs to do it. But few of us have the heart for it while we are dangling from one end of the broken bond broken by someone else's cruelty. You ever been at the other end of someone else's cruelty? And when you are, as he says, dangling from one end of the broken bond uh, by someone else's cruelty, it's hard in that situation to start talking forgiveness. But Jesus did, and He's got every right to ask me to as well, because He did. He did. Ephesians chapter 4, in the latter part of that chapter, there are some very simple statements on this topic. Verse 31 and 32 Well, let me start with 30. He's talked about, don't steal anymore, verse 28. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, verse 29. Make sure that what what you do is building up. And then he says in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And he says this, verse 30. And 32, Ephesians chapter 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with along with all malice. In other words, take malice along with it. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Why? Because God forgave you. That's why. The truth is, forgiveness is necessary in every relationship. Forgiveness is necessary in every relationship. Statement out of Luke chapter 6, out of the sermon uh, there, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. We don't operate the way the world does, do we? We do not. The world operates in a very simple way. You hit me, I hit you. You kick me, I kick you. You hurt me, I hurt you. We give back what people give to us. That's reciprocity. And the world operates on reciprocity. We're challenged to operate by the golden rule. I'm challenged by our God to treat you the way I would want you to treat me, not the way you have treated me. That's the challenge of living life the way our God would have us to live us. As we said earlier, Jesus taught us to go first because He went first. And He was following His Father's lead when He went first. 
this is probably something I would have been better off to have brought something to uh, give more of a graphic image of it. Marriage is as true as most other relationships. Uh, operate in a three-stage cycle. There's a book that I would highly recommend to you. Uh, I think I can come up with it right quick because I would seriously recommend that you order this book and read it. I think I can come across it right quick. Yes. It's a book entitled The Power of Habit. Anybody familiar with it? It looks like that right there. Anybody see that well enough? Uh, it's a yellow book, uh, and it's got three people in a hamster wheel, basically, running around. Uh, and it's, it's a guy named Charles Duhigg. Uh, I don't know how successful he is. I, if I was very successful, I would probably change that name. But uh, he, he, you know, his, his mother gave it to him, and it was okay. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is one of the most significant small books I have read in forever. And it is a small book. It's not, it's not a spiritual book. Uh, and so I can hardly recommend it to you because I don't have to say, well, most of it I like, but you know how you do, Josh. But there's those few things in there you have to look over. And I'm not saying you're going to like everything about this. I'm just saying it speaks to the habits that we get into. And it speaks to the relational habits that we get into. Uh, and other people have noted this, but uh, Duhigg in that book, The Power of Habit. And if you're a sports fan, uh, there's a great, great analogy uh, in, in, that, in that book uh, for sports fans as well. One of his major illustrations uh, is, is uh, from, a, from a football coach. In a triangular cycle, if you will, most relationships go from intimacy, and by that I simply mean getting along. You know, with in, in a spouse intimacy, uh, in marriage intimacy means a little bit more than that. Obviously, it's that it's that oneness uh, being right. It, it's that closeness. In other relationships, it's just that things are good. We're not upset at one another. We're not angry. You know, but we go from intimacy to conflict to withdrawal, as though they're three points of a pyramid. We go from intimacy, and then there's conflict. There's problem. There is a problem, and then because of problems, we withdraw. We pull back, don't we? We get offended. We get our feelings hurt. We pull back just a little bit. And when we pull back, the question is, how long are you going to stay there? Now, in your marriage, if you're, if, 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 if you're thinking marriage right here tonight, you know how long you stay there. I could ask you and, and, and have, you, have you fill out silent ballots, you know? And, and two people in a marriage would basically give a close to the same answer because we know how long we stay there. Some people stay there a day. Some people stay there a week. Some people stay there a month. There was a, a, a guy that taught at Harding for a generation, Dr. Neil Pryor. Anybody who went to Harding in the last... 50 years knows Neil Pryor and Neil Pryor t tells a story about when he and his wife first got married he said we were we were trying to be spiritual we were trying to be mature Christians he said so we made a pact he said out of Ephesians chapter 4 where it says uh, there right before the reading that we just read let not the sun go down on your wrath you know that verse and he said we made a we made an agreement he said his wife Treva it's her name uh, that Treva and I made an agreement. We would not go to bed angry. He said, we made, a, we made a pact that we would settle our differences before we closed in for the evening. He said, we did it. We did it. And then he would pause for dramatic effect. And he'd always say, he had a pat answer, because I heard him say this a few times. He'd say, sometimes it makes you want to stay up all night long. <laughs> and that was his line. Because if you're, going to, if you're going to agree that you're going to solve every problem before you go to bed, you kind of get to want to pull an all-nighter, don't you? Mm -hmm. 
Because sometimes you're just in the mood to be mad for a while. Anybody willing to admit that sometimes you're just in the mood to be mad for a while? I can sing another verse. (laughs) You know, sometimes we are. But he was right about that. We need to solve our problems. We need to have a, a, a plan for solving our problems. Uh, there's a guy also at Harding, uh, was a good friend of mine for many years, uh, Randy Willingham. Randy Willingham is a trained conflict management expert. He was trained by Charles Seibert, who was an absolute genius at it, who was also trained uh, uh, Randy, whatever his name was, who was a tremendous conflict management expert. So Randy had some real training. I always told Randy and a lot of other people, Keith knows him really well, and we would say that you're a conflict management expert because you like conflict. You like to mix it up. And so it was just one of those things that you like to do, and so you, you do it. But he was really good at it. He, and he tells a story about one night. He said it was early in their marriage, and you know he, he's, he's got these expertise, or at least he's working on these expertise. He thought, if my wife could just hear herself, she would know that she was wrong. If she could just listen back. So he says, one night we were in a little bit of an argument. I taped her. I taped us. Now, you know, we're all knowing by this point, that was a bad decision. Uh, That was a bad, bad decision. And he'll quickly say, that was a bad decision. He said, so because we were, we were talking about whatever we were talking about, and he said, dear, I just need you to listen to this just for a moment. And he said, so he pushed play, and he let it go about five minutes, and he was expecting her to say, well, well, well honey, you're obviously right. But he said, when, when she had listened to herself for that five minutes, she said, see, I told you, you know, because she absolutely believed she was right. And she probably was in reality uh, because, you know, we just, we, we see the way we're doing it. We're, we're in conflict and sometimes we just want to, we're ready to have a conflict. Mm-hmm. Anybody ever admit having a bad day at work, coming home, picking a fight with your wife? Mm-hmm. Anybody ever admit having a bad day at work, coming home, picking a fight with your husband? <laughs> if we couldn't win the fight earlier, we tend to pick one we can win. Anybody ever do that with their children? Have you seen that commercial lately? I don't even remember what they're. I don't remember what they're advertising. But you remember that commercial after? Yeah, I'm not trying try not solving. I'm having caused any family problems here. Just saying, you know. <laughs> if you want to just look up at me and say, "Amen, brother." Amen. Uh, but uh, you seen that new commercial where the where the couple is about to go camping? And, and, and she says, you forgot the life jackets. And he says, I wasn't supposed to get the life jackets. Anybody seen that commercial? It's, it's a great commercial. I love the commercial. Because, you know, anything that's really funny is just a play on normal life mm-hmm. that's just well placed. And they come, and when they're arguing about who left the life jackets, he pulls a challenge flag out of his pocket. And she says, I see you have a challenge flag. And he drops it. Guy rushes in with that black box with the, you know, with the, with the little blinders on it with the pole, and he rushes in, and he sets it between them, and they're going to look at the replay. The replay, you know? And, and then at the, at the, you know, she looks at it, and she starts getting a grin on her face, and, and about that time, he sort of goes, you know, kind of goes blank on the face, and, and she says, I especially love that part where you said, well, obviously, I will never forget the life jackets. Because they'd actually got the replay of their relationship, and, and there it was, you know. Uh, interesting thing about replays is I see replays the way I saw them. Somebody else sees replays the way they saw them. Was it past interference? You know what's the biggest determination between was it past interference or not? It was whether the defense was my team or whether the receiver was my team. That's the biggest determining factor in whether or not it was pass interference. Right? We see things the way we see things, and we tend to think they are right.
Matthew chapter 6, if you would. Matthew chapter 6. We know this as the model prayer. Some people commonly refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Most of us would argue that the Lord's Prayer was probably prayed in Gethsemane. Because this is not really Jesus' earnest prayer so much as it is Jesus teaching His disciples how to pray. So it's probably well tagged as the model prayer. We know it well. We know the prayer very well. Verse 9 says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. I believe that verse 12 is indeed the scariest verse in all of Scripture. You ask people, what's the scariest verse in all of Scripture? A lot of people are going to say, well, those verses on hell, those verses on hell are scary. We don't talk much about hell, but there's actually several verses on it. Uh, But I would argue with you that this is the scariest verse in the Bible. And it's scary because it's a prayer where I am asking God for something. If I'm praying this prayer. And it's the model prayer, so I should be praying this prayer, okay? And what am I asking God for? I'm asking God to forgive me the way I forgive others. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking God to forgive me the way I forgive other people. Now, do you really want to ask God for that? Do we really want to ask God for that? Is that really what we want from God? No. It, it better be. It better be. And you say, well, see, that's just your interpretation of that. Nope, it's not. Because this is one of the, and this, this also shows us why this is so important. And it's important, and it's, it's, it's highlighted as important because it's one of those places where Jesus comments on his own statements. Jesus gives commentary. And it's the first commentary that he gives after he said these things. He could have commented on any of, the, any of the five or six things that he mentioned there, but he did not. He could have commented on, your kingdom come, your will be done. We would have liked a little comment on that one, right? He could have commented on, uh, Father, hallowed, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or maybe, give us this day our daily bread. I mean, what, how much can we want for and, and, and not be having showing a bad attitude? But what he commented on was verse 12. Verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That just made verse 12 scary to me. And if we didn't if we if we didn't need the the second commentary, uh, you know, we'd kind of like it to be left off, but I think sometimes we need it. It's just the negative side of the same thing. He says, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. So what that teaches me is that every time I go to ask God for forgiveness for my failures, I better be first asking myself the question, how well am I forgiving other people around me? Because I don't get to refuse to forgive you and then get to ask God to forgive me. That's scary to me. 
That's scary to me. Again, it's one of those places that teaches me that, folks, this thing is simpler than I think it is. I think it's uh, maybe Dr. Ferguson uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a really a significant book. Uh, maybe not Ben, so I won't, I won't attribute it to him. But he says, basically, that sometimes we complicate Scripture because complicating is easier than obeying its simplicity. If we had time, and we're not going to take time, I think you're familiar with these things, but I would challenge you to go back and look at them if it's something that's not a real strong point of familiarity. Uh, there are three significant different directions that forgiveness is given in Scripture. Three different words, all translated in most places as forgiveness. Uh, one is Matthew 26, 28, where fit forgiveness is remission or dismissal of sin. I removed the guilt. I took it away. I dismissed it. Someone comes to you and they said something that, uh, that they thought offended you. And you say, oh, don't give it a second thought. I didn't. You dismissed it. You just simply dismissed it. You, you didn't credit it or you credit it and then you let it go. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 4 where, where he's talking about what Jesus came to do and he talked about release of the captives. It's that same word as forgiveness. He released them. He released it. Uh, in Luke 37, or, or 637, I'm sorry, where we were looking uh, uh, a minute ago and we're, we're talking about their uh, forgiveness, it is that idea of a letting go, which is very similar. It's, it's, it's a different word, but it's a very similar. Now, the interesting thing about this word is it's the same word used in the discussion of, of marriage and divorce in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31 where it says you'd, they were divorced, they were sent away. It's the word that is otherwise given in other places as forgiveness because the sin or the offense was sent away. And I find it interesting that the same word is used of sending a spouse away, and yet the same word is also used of forgiving one in, in, in another verse because that's what the word meant. The word meant to release it, to release it. If you think back to the Old Testament, uh, you know, during the Day of Atonement, wh where, was the, where did the sin go and what did they do with it? The scapegoat, right? And what did they do? They released it. They released it, and it, it went away. They sent it out. And so, again, all those places where so much in Scripture just comes right back in and lines up with something else that we knew from Scripture. In Colossians 3.13 is a good example of the other word that is given as forgiveness, and it is given in most of our Bibles as forgiveness in that word. And in that case, forgiveness is grace. It is a favor. You know, sometimes I released you from an offense as a favor to you because I want to be kind to you. We just let it go. We let it go. It was a gift. It was a favor. Forgiveness is a gift. And it is a, it is a gift sometimes that the offending party may deserve and may not deserve. But it's a gift we can give. And... We will serve ourselves, our marriage and every other relationship, we will serve ourselves so well if we, will, if we will form the habit and nurture the habit of being able to forgive, to let things go, and to, and to give that gift of forgiveness. And partly, if, and if for no other reason, so that it can, it can just illustrate and can show us that we're becoming more like our God. We're becoming more like our Lord Jesus when we can do that because that's what God did for us. 
a lot of people I've heard over the years struggle with what grace means. And, and the main reason why people struggle with grace is that so many people want grace be permission to go ahead and sin. You know, and in my mind, Paul took care of that in the end of Romans chapter 5 and the first Romans chapter 6. He, he, he said, that's not the way this works, folks. It's not the way this works. Uh, but, but grace is that gift. And if you want to understand the grace of God in the broader scheme, uh, you define the grace of God as Jesus Himself. Jesus Himself is the grace of God because He is the gift, the gift that provided for forgiveness. So many people want to talk about grace and they want to say, you know, at the end of their life and they, and they, and they picture themselves before God in judgment and, oh God, now I need your grace. And, and I think God would look at us and say, folks, I sent my grace 2,000 years ago. What you're begging for is mercy. That's a different animal. Because my grace has been extended to you. His grace has been extended to us in the person and in the sacrifice and in the offering of His Son, Jesus. Gandhi, it's a good quote on Gandhi there. Uh, I, I headed it by saying, forgiveness is not for the weak of heart. It's not, is it? You have to be strong to forgive. It takes more strength to forgive than not to forgive. Anybody can hold a grudge. Been dealing with a man for several years now. I would like to say to you that he's getting better. He's not getting better, he's just his mind's going. It's a guy at church, I know very well, and he holds bitterness in his heart. I've known several people like this over the years, and you have too, I'm sure. Holds bitterness in their heart. Refuse to forgive because they see the, the thing that has been done to them as so terribly wrong. And they've been hurt so bad that they can't let it go. And I, wanted, and I, and I have, uh, on a couple of people, told them that what you're hanging on to is not as big as you make it out to be. And in reality, what you're hanging on to is not beer, near as big as what God has already let go with you. Because that's what forgiveness is. That's what forgiveness is. Uh, the statement by Gandhi is, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. No one would argue that our God is weak when He offers forgiveness to us. No one would argue that Jesus is weak when He died for our salvation. We would argue that takes great strength. And for us to be a people who forgive, show strength, not weakness. There may be places in our lives individually right now, relationships and struggles in relationships, at which what we really need to do is to have the humility to walk up to someone and say, forgive me, I'm wrong. I have been wrong. Weak people can't do that. Only the strong can. Two things in closing about forgiveness. It is forgiveness that opens up the future. It opens up the future. It says goodbye to the past. It puts past in the past. And it says, let's move on. That's what forgiveness does. Forgiveness opens up the future. And the second thing, trying to keep my before eight commitment here. Forgiveness is a choice. You don't say, and, and I hear people say it all the time. Well, if they had said to you what they said to me, and sometimes I want to just say, and sometimes I may have do. Brother, sister, if they had said to me what they said to you, I would forgive them, and that's what you've got to do. Forgiveness is a choice. It's a decision about who I want to be. And I, and I believe you, have made the commitment that I want to be like Jesus.
he forgives. You know, the, the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 illustrates that our God not only forgives, but he looks to forgive. Every indication in that story is that the father was watching the road, seeing when his son was going to come home. And he didn't wait till he got there. He met him down the road. He met him down the road ready to forgive. We're going to stop right there. I appreciate your kind attention today. Uh, Like I say, as we move on tomorrow, we're going to be talking about parenting. Then we're going to be talking about non-Christian relationships, non-believer relationships. And then we're going to be talking about church. And in the first session, I'm going to present some material to you. In the second session, uh, I've been at this long enough to know, you don't start a session and say, let's talk. You talk for about five or ten minutes, and then you get people to thinking, and, and then you can talk a little bit. And so that's kind of what we'll do. That'll be our pattern uh, for, for the next uh, three nights. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Are you going to, anybody, one of you are going to close up after I get through? Okay. Uh, I will uh, uh, let you do that. Uh, before we do that, pray with me just for a moment. Our gracious Father, help us, Father to be people who love enough to forgive. Help us to be deeply touched with the forgiveness that you have given us individually. And help us to know, Father, that the more we look like you, the more we take on attributes that are yours, we will be forgiving people. We will learn to forgive because we will want to forgive because we will want to mend relationships. And we will want to bring those relationships where they can be. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for these good people. Thank you for their kind attention. In Jesus' name we pray. for being here and uh, hopefully you got some good things to chew on, some good uh, thoughts and uh, some things to reflect on. Uh, that's really what uh, we want to do is uh, get an opportunity to get those get those uh, juices firing because um, as we heard at the men's retreat, uh, if you do not take action on some of these new thoughts in the next 48 hours, then the chances are you will not do it. If you do not take action, on something that you heard tonight or today, if you don't take action in the next 48 hours, you probably will not do it. So if there's something that you can go home tonight before you go to bed, look at your notes, think about something that was said, think about something that maybe I could work on, pray to God and say, God, I want to do this and strengthen me, empower me, help me and uh, make it a point that tomorrow let's try to apply something that, that, that we got. And I know that uh, if we do that, like he said, just change one thing, just one thing, it can really make a difference. So that's what we're all trying to do is grow those relationships, grow that relationship with our Lord. And uh, I pray that one of the things that you guys will do is uh, make a commitment to come back tomorrow night. And uh, it's, it's going to be a blessing. Guys, it's going to be great. And uh, so I know some of us can't, but uh, for, for all that can, let's, uh, let's really make an effort. And uh, again, we've got kids' classes, teen classes, adult classes, plenty of food, lots of great fellowships. So let's uh, really make that uh, an effort for tomorrow. Amen? All right. We are dismissed. Thank you, brother.